uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, we have our um, last uh, lecture of the school with Alejandro, uh, remembering that after we are going to announce uh, two more prizes, the uh, Christian Smiglo Prize, so please stay until the end. Well, thanks Alejandro. So, congratulations on making it to the very last lecture of the, the week. So, imagine it's, it's been a long week for all of you. And so, let's wrap up uh, this session with the last piece that I promised you is, let's try to integrate everything that we learned now with the perspective of how can we do actually uh, my quantum machine learning with this type of devices, with these quantum annealing uh, devices. So again, our motivation is the same. So we want to try to spot some applications in the real world that actually we could do that. And I think in the first lecture, I mentioned to you uh, that actually one of the capabilities of quantum annealing devices is usually is that you can sample approximately from Boltzmann distributions. Uh, this is, a, as I mentioned in that lecture, uh, this would be helpful because there is a piece within the whole training pipeline that is very difficult to compute. It's actually where I mentioned this Marco Che Monte Carlo procedures that are intractable. And the idea is that maybe if you can sample from a Boltzmann distribution, which is the complex piece here, then actually you can speed up the process or at least get better models. I mentioned as well some of the applications, is, for example, is in the training of RBMs, and there's some of the potential applications that we were working back in the day, is anything that is related to deep learning, and that was one of the motivations of our work. So nobody actually caught me this morning and saying, hey Alejandro, you're saying that actually we're using the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics, we're using these quantum devices for solving, finding the ground state of Hamiltonians, so basically the probability of observing the ground state is close to one, how come you're telling us now that actually you're sampling from a Boltzmann distribution? At the end of the day, what is exactly what you're doing? So the answer is, actually you can do both, and the reality is that, I, as I said, the motivation for quantum annealing is that, but in reality, in these devices, what happens is something different. Basically what happens is, let's take a look actually, this is an old example, this is from 2012, of this protein folding type of problem. So here is the manifold, the energy states of the combinatorial optimization problem. Here is the energy, so those are the, this is the eigenspectrum of the time-dependent Hamiltonian, and basically I'm subtracting from, remember it's a time-dependent Hamiltonian, but I'm subtracting the ground state. So the ground state is the baseline, and then basically that's the spectrum. So our first excited state would be this one, and this is the energy crossing. This is kind of like the, 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 the closest, uh, the smallest gap in the time-independent evolution. So something that is actually very curious, and that's why, that's why I was telling it's important for experimentalists uh, to recognize, for example, if you're having a coherent evolution or not, is tell me the energy scale and tell me also the temperature of your device. And what you see actually is that this device, although when you see, I mean, the, the propaganda from deep wave, saying, oh, this device actually is 20 millikelvin, so it's uh, 200 times colder than deep space, because deep space is of the order of uh, 3 kelvin. It is true, and it's amazing actually that you can reach those temperatures with those devices, but the truth is actually is that that temperature is comparable to the gap of the device, when actually when you do the time-dependent Hamiltonian. And that's actually, that can be, as, a, as Sabrina mentioned, that can be exploited as an asset actually, and that's that's the motivation and that's the reason, the main reason why you can actually sample from, from, from Boltzmann distribution, for thermal distribution. So basically, if you were paying really, really close attention to Sabrina throughout the week, the only way to describe this device, given that you have a large temperature and that the device is noisy, so basically you're working in an intermediate or strong actually coupling regime, basically you have an open quantum system, the system most likely will thermalize at some point or in the most part of the evolution. And that's, that's the reason why it's important if you're programming these devices just to actually know the physics behind. This is actually work that we did back uh, when I was a PhD student and we even did actually block redfield simulations. By now you know what, what they mean most likely. This is actually this perturbative expansion. So they, with math, this is one of the master equations that most likely you covered maybe in the first lecture with a Markovian model. That's what we saw this morning. And is it actually we assumed the simplest one. We didn't go to no Markovian models. And then, for example, all the spectral density, something beautiful is that since it is a real device, you can access and measure the spectral densities that you saw in theory in the blackboard this morning with uh, Sabrina. We can access and measure all these spectral densities are extracted directly from the experiments. 
and then basically there is no adjustable parameters. This is the type of simulation that you can do, other than assuming that you are doing a block Redfield equation. Basically, that's the type of simulation, and you can simulate actually what's the probability in the ground state. That's the density matrix. For example, we're looking at the diagonal elements. And basically, if you look at the, at the probability of occupying the states, you notice that there is a dip. Guess when that happens? Of course, at the gap, because actually that's when most of the population transfer is happening. But then, notice another thing is that as the gap opens up in the spectrum, of course, there is a lot of relaxation coming down after you pass the point. Remember, this is a very complex time-dependent process. I told you the plain vanilla version is adiabatic quantum computation, but this is the real thing. And what happens actually is that you start depopulating the ground state. Sorry, you start depopulating, but then you start gaining some population back in the ground state precisely because of the relaxation. The gap is larger. If I actually plot here, that's something I haven't done. If I plot here the thermal distribution on top of this, like the the Gibbs distribution with the time-dependent Hamiltonian, it will track actually very, very closely the, the Hamiltonian here up to this point, and then actually it will continue. Notice that here it plateaus. So this is actually something that is not mysterious. It can be easily explained from simulations and from the physics of the device. And basically what is happening is that since the, since the time-dependent Hamiltonian, the sigma x is dying off, the main source of noise, the coupling to the path that Sabrina was talking throughout this week, the coupling to the path in this device happens through sigma z. And basically, so once, once actually the, the x Hamiltonian is turned off, basically there is no way to gain more probability here and the system kind of like freezes. So this is extremely important for, for machine learning as we're going to see, because basically the concept, well, by the way, this is actually the probabilities from the experiment and the theory for this 8 qubit, it was an 8 qubit experiment, you see it matches pretty well. If I would have plotted here the adiabatic quantum computation result, assuming there is no temperature, there is no path, the probability would be almost 100%, 99.999% for this time scale and for this type of process. So definitely all that is happening is the open quantum system dynamics here. But going back to the thermal distribution, so if you look at this, actually there is a freezing point in this case, it's close to maybe 0 0.48, 0 0.5. And then after that, actually, there is basically no evolution. It looks like the ground state, the probability in the ground state is frozen. And that's what you get. So that's very important. Why? Because first, it looks like the device is, is coupled to the, to the bath, is coupled to the, to the thermal reservoir. And that means that you follow very closely this Gibbs distribution. But that's also bad. It's bad because basically the bad news is that you don't know exactly when is it going to freeze. First of all, because you never know when is the gap. The gap is going to happen. Otherwise, you need to diagonalize the Hamiltonian at a, every point. And that's an intractable time. You have a two-dimensional Hilbert space. I can do this because it's an eight qubit. But once you have a real system, there's no way you can guess what's the gap happening exactly. And you don't know exactly how, how long after the gap the system will freeze. So you know that you will get a Boltzmann distribution. You don't know where. That's the problem. So it's a good thing and a bad thing. So actually, this particular observation, it was known to the guys from D-Wave. Even back in the day, I think they published this work in 2010. That was partly the motivation of our work with Marcello, I think with my PhD student. As I told you, we were looking for hard problems. And they, they proposed here that the device was following very closely thermal distributions. But the problem was they didn't know which temperature actually it is. And it's definitely not the device temperature. Because actually, as I mentioned here, the probability of the device temperature it would ramp up the probability here. So the gap continues to open. And if it were the device temperature, the probability would be, would be much higher in the ground state. But it's not. So it's an effective temperature related at the freezing point, And basically, we don't know what it is. So that was what was proposed here. And the work that we proposed, actually, the, the follow-up, the first paper that we had with Marcello, he was actually back then a, an intern at NASA doing his master. What we did actually is to propose a robust algorithm that, that you can infer with the same samples that you're going to use to train the Boltzmann machines. You're going to recycle those samples, and with those samples, you can estimate the temperature of the device. Not the temperature of the device, the effective temperature at which the Boltzmann distribution is frozen. So that was basically the proposal in this paper. And I will show you actually 
some uh, figures that show that indeed we were able to estimate the temperature and that if you don't estimate the temperature, you're lost in the training process, in the machine learning process. So there was actually a follow-up right after our paper from the guys from D-Wave, kind of like refining the technique that we proposed and just uh, because, I mean, it's not bulletproof. Basically, the problem here of inferring the temperature is an intractable problem in its own. So we proposed an efficient way to do it, but there are, there are certainly room for improvements. Now, what I wanted to actually walk you, so I hope with that, you see actually, you can answer even the question of why is that that then you're solving combinatorial optimization problems? If you don't have an adiabatic quantum computer, if you don't have a quantum annealing in a seed of temperature. The reason is because the Boltzmann distribution, of course, is favored in the ground state, and then you still get a significant amount of probability in the ground state, as you saw here. 80% is not bad. And then basically, you, are, you can still actually, you're solving natively the combinatorial optimization problem. But then it's not because of the Debari theorem of quantum mechanics, so I lied. I gave you an intuition of how this, all the history of how this algorithm evolved. But in reality, it's, it's because basically you have an open quantum system that is thermalizing, and then that's what's happening. So now, let's go back to our quantum machine learning story, the hybrid approach. And I told you that I was going to walk you through different examples of how it actually works. I've been talking kind of like uh, still in high-level terms. So let's, let's take a look in more depth, actually understanding. OK, let's assume that actually you can sample from Boltzmann. How will you use that? So that's what we're going to answer in the next slides. Uh, and it's basically it's the, it's the purpose of this paper in 2000, if you're curious. So basically, by estimating the effective temperature, we know now which is the Boltzmann distribution that we are sampling from. And since we know the Boltzmann distribution, now we can use that in machine learning. What you're going to see next is how. Okay, so let's go maybe, let's go to the blackboard and let's have some fun actually understanding uh, the training of Boltzmann machines. So you're going to learn two things for the price of one. So you're going to learn actually how we use the devices and you're going to learn a lot of machine learning, how you actually train these uh, this Boltzmann machines, classically, and stochastic gradient descent. So now we're going to see the gut of the algorithm, of the classical algorithm. Any questions up to that? Questions? So let's actually, let's discuss a bit about the, the training of these Boltzmann machines. I didn't, I mean, I didn't define this within the QCBM work because basically there was not a real comparison. Here it's important because actually we're going to use the device to actually to assist the training of these Boltzmann machines. So we need to really define it here. In the other work, just to con for contrast, in the other work, we used a quantum model, so we didn't rely on Boltzmann distributions at all in the first place. Like the Barson stripe is not a Boltzmann distribution. So, but here we're gonna need it. We're gonna need it to, to continue. And it's a good excuse for you to learn uh, Boltzmann machines. So let me go back to, to actually something we discussed briefly last time. And it's the case of, uh, of these probabilistic graphical models that are called Boltzmann machines. So here actually, I'm going to define, let's say, this, this, uh, this five-node <coughs> graph. And as I told you, actually, usually it's a Boltzmann machine for, for, for a couple of reasons. So it's an undirected graph. Usually what I can do is I can associate an energy expression that is going to depend on theta. And this is basically the type of Hamiltonian that you have in the D-Way device. So the first thing that we're going to discuss actually is this case of the fully visible Boltzmann machine. And it's fully visible because 
basically we have no 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 this we're not using these hidden variables or un unseen variables. We're gonna actually discuss the RPMs that in a second at the end. So in the when we actually were this, we're dealing with these guys, so basically our Hamiltonian or our energy energy model only involves visible units, as you can see here. There, are, there is not, nothing but just the, the model. The J i j correspond to the edges, as we discussed. And basically, in order for it to be a Boltzmann machine, we need a probability distribution that is, as we discussed in the previous lecture, T divided C of theta. And C of theta, as you know, is just a partition function. Just a partition function. So as we discussed, there are some challenges, and that's precisely those challenges that we're going to resolve here. The challenge is, how do we train this? Because we discussed that there was an important quantity that is called the negative log likelihood. There was a quantity called the negative log likelihood that depends on these parameters theta. Theta here, remember, theta is just the h's and j's in this specific case. I remember this quantity goes over the data set available, and it computes this, the logarithm of the model evaluated at each one of these points. So it's something, I mean, in principle, if I know the partition function at each point, and since I know the data set that is these guys, the VIs, that there are D of those, that's the data set, the training set, then basically I can compute this quantity. And the idea is to, of course, as we pointed, is to find um, find theta such that CNLL is mean. Hopefully the global minimum. So basically, you're trying to find the model that best describes the data. And that's the way you would do it. So how are we going to do this if we cannot even compute the partition function in the first place? I mean, it looks like it's an intractable piece. But that's where actually, when this technique, this widely used technique in machine learning, comes to, comes to help. This is actually, that's when a stochastic gradient descent comes. So a stochastic gradient descent is very simple technique. Just need calculus, calculus the first year of calculus to, to understand it. So basically, note that these parameters theta here in reality, theta is just, you can consider this to be an array of all the hi's, or h1, all the way to hn, and then the j12, blah, 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 all the way to maybe j n minus 1n, if you had an all to all graph, for example. So it's basically it's a collection of all the parameters, the model parameters. So theta is that vector. You can take that being a vector. So what a stochastic gradient descent is, it tells you is, remember, we are talking about machine learning, so we need to have a learning and iteration process. What it tells you is that if you want to compute the value of the parameters at t plus 1, then basically what you would do is you use what you learned in calculus. Basically, you will follow the gradient. Because the gradient is the direction of maximum minimization or, or, or maximization. So there is an eta. And then, of course, I mean, you need to take it with respect to the function that you're minimizing. So you're taking the gradient of the, of the function that you're minimizing, and you're just following the gradient. So that's what is actually stochastic gradient descent. More specifically, just to, to be more precise, for example, if you want to update the hi, you would take the value of hi at time t, so that's basically as you're doing these learning iterations, and then you would follow the derivative of nll of theta, the partial derivative with respect to hi, to that parameter, because that's, that's the way you would break this down. Or for example, if you have jij, then basically you would do the same thing, jij at time t minus eta the partial derivative of NLL of theta with respect to JIJ. 
So how is that actually helping us? So let's actually let's see actually what, what you can do. So the first thing let me actually express. We're gonna see actually with this actually we'll solve all of our problems. Uh, yeah. So basically I'm gonna we're gonna rewrite and do everything. So don't don't worry about the, the previous slide. So now remember CNL is just this quantity. Put theta of b. Yeah. So now, let me actually just rewrite this. Let me just rewrite this as Let me just actually rewrite this by using the definition D. You can take actually the log of this guy of Q, and you see actually that that's when actually being Boltzmann it buys you a lot. Because basically we can take down, this is going to be minus exponential of this. And we write a t. So that's the, that's the, we're actually basically just opening the, opening the log here, applying log of Q, and then minus the log of the partition function. So just basically breaking, taking the log of Q. What you see here already is that you get basically, you get a positive sign. Let me actually just take the t out, e to the minus vi theta. And then this would be plus. It is actually this parameter, this, this, this quantity here actually doesn't depend on the, on the data set itself. The partition function doesn't depend on the data set. You're summing over all the possible bit strings. So basically, you get d times, because you have d data set, logarithm of c of theta. Yes, it's outside. This one? Yes. Yes, thank you. Sorry, yes. Um, sorry, I think then there is something wrong. Actually, then I need to take the log. So the log of the, num the, log of the numerator, I need to take it down. So the mistake is here. It's actually it's not e to this. It's just, it's just actually, yeah, thank you. So it's just bi of theta. So here, when I take the log of the first term of the numerator, I, I should be just removing this guy. Just basically taking this guy. Is it understood? Yeah. So thank you. Good catch. So, so now, what we do is now we're ready to, that, that, that is convenient because now we can actually, let's take the, the derivative. Let's actually work just one of those. CNL divided HI. And what you will see is from the definition, basically from the definition of, of, the, of the energy expression, we can see that when we take the derivative here, when we take the derivative of this guy with respect to HI, basically you're pulling out, well, actually let me just to avoid confusion with the I, let me just call this with respect to J with the jth parameter. So basically what you would pick up is i, because I'm already using i here, you would pick up just that term. You see that? So basically I'm just pulling out the jth term from this sum, because that's the only one that depends on, on, on hj. And then from this side, basically I'll have 1 over c of theta. And then you have now the log of, of that one, the derivative of this one, it would be e to the minus v of theta divided t. And then on top of that, you have a, an internal derivative here of the, exp of the exponent. So it's the derivative of the log is 1 over this, the argument. And then you have the internal derivative that is minus, is the derivative of the, of the argument of the exponent. It would be minus v 
Vj divided T. Is that clear? So basically, we're just taking the partial derivative of this argument here. There is one thing here, and is that uh, I'm missing here. I mean, I need to take actually. This is the I'm here missing the sum over v, because actually that's a partition function. No, it was coming directly from the partition function. So what you see here is now. First of all, I can take. Let me actually take the d over t as a common as a common factor. And then here notice that I get one over d sum over i equals one to d of this of this particular uh, of this particular uh, j bit or j spin from the data set. Summing over all the data set. And then here I get a minus. Notice what is this? This guy here is nothing by Q. This is my Q of theta. If you remember correctly, this is my Q of theta of V. And basically, since I'm putting this, so basically this is just, this, this term in itself, this term, is just sum over all the possible bit strings of Q of theta of V. Well, let, me, let me write it down here. Minus sum over v of q of theta of v multiplying vj. And here is actually when you arrive to the key expression that this is nothing, remember that when I told you in the first lecture that if you know that you have samples from the probability distribution of the data that that's precisely where the data set is coming from, so this is nothing but just an average over vj over the data. And this guy here is nothing but just the average over Vj over my Q of theta. And this is the, 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 the widely known equation that you will see in this. I mean, one way to rewrite this that you will see in machine learning purpose is actually is that people will say that the gradient of this quantity proportional to Vj average over the data minus the vj average over the, the, the model. That's what they mean by the model. So, and here is where actually things become interesting. Because that means that if we want to update, by the way, if you do this guy, j i j, you will get the same thing, dt, but now you would get vi, vj, theta, minus the, qua the quadratic, the, the, the quadratic correlations, vj, so the products of these guys. So this quantity actually is very straightforward because you have the data, all that, all that you need to know is kind of like what's the spin, the ith spin in each one of the data and just sum, and sum, sum, sum them over and just average them. That's the only thing that you need to do. It's very simple and this doesn't depend on probabilities, nothing, just you take the data, and you can fit this. So this term doesn't depend on anything at all, just the data set. But this guy actually is the complicated one, and that's what makes sampling intractable. Because this term, you need to get samples from this probability distribution, as, as we know, we don't know the partition function, we don't know the probability, we don't know how to get samples from that, from that probability distribution exactly. So that's actually, in this particular case, that's when you resort, in the most cases, to, well, there are ways to do this approximately. That's when you do Marco Che Monte Carlo or give sampling in some cases. So that's actually where you use your analytical, uh, your numerical uh, computation courses where you learn give sampling or, and then basically you can estimate samples as if they were coming from a thermal distribution and you can use those ones to compute an estimate of these ones. And that's when things actually become out of, out of lust for the classical machine learning people because if, if this model happened to be in a rough energy landscape, then basically you're, gonna get, you're not going to be able to thermalize the system that easily. And that's when actually a quantum computer might help. So here's what actually you've seen in my slides that this is the bottleneck. So here's the bottleneck, here's the bottleneck. So it's just this second term, the only thing that you really need to worry about doing in a quantum device. So now, in the case, now let me go back to the case of uh, 
of the, how do you actually, what is an RVM, and how do you actually even train those ones? So actually an RVM is very similar. It's another probabilistic graphical model. For example, it's a restricted Boltzmann machine. And then, the only, the only different thing is that now, remember, we discussed last time, we're going to have some unseen variables. This is this layer. And then we're going to have some visible variables. That's where the data comes, is loaded here in this level. Here is data. And here is just ancilla variables that help for the correlation between the, this and this visible variables. You're going to see actually in a minute why this construction is useful for them. So you're going to see why this model was proposed in the 80s, the fully visible machines, and it was dropped basically because nobody knew how to compute this efficiently. And then the, they saw that they could make progress with the RBMs. And that's why they're widely used now in, in machine learning. So.